Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second live webinar in Applied Sciences and Technology in Archaeology, titled GIS in Heritage Management. My name is Gerardo Diaz from Ben Gurion University in Israel, and it is my pleasure to be your host during this webinar. This has been made possible thanks to the Israeli Embassy in Mexico, the Mexican Embassy in Israel, Tel Aviv University, Anahuac University, and of course, thanks to Nitsan, Rosaura, and Andrea, whose contribution has been superb to make this happen. This series of webinars are aimed at fostering the contribution and the connection among researchers and professionals from Mexico and Israel in the field of applied sciences and technology in archaeology. And every time we also have a host from overseas, at this time, Julia from Poland, and uh, and I will also like to remind you that the, this webinar will be recorded so you can find it in our YouTube channel. Or if you join to our mailing list, it will be sent to you. Um, also, I would like to remind you that all the questions that you may have will be answered at the end. That means after the last session of this event. So now I would like to hand it over to Inat Kranz, the Israeli ambassador in Mexico, who will deliver the opening words for today's webinar. Thank you very much. Good morning to the participants who are joining us from Mexico and good afternoon to the participants who are joining us from Israel. It's a pleasure and an honor to inaugurate the second webinar of Applied Sciences and Technology in Archaeology, focusing on geographical information systems applied in archaeology. I want to thank Andrea Garza and all the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in this important webinar. And to congratulate, and I want to congratulate the scholars from Tel Aviv University, Ben Gurion University, Universidad Anahuac, and of course the experts that will share their work with us today for their dedication and scientific achievements. Israel and Mexico have a long history of friendship and cooperation, and have lots in common. Both countries have a rich cultural heritage, which is enormously appreciated by their people. Both people apply great importance to the unveiling of their roots and their past. And both have high level academic and archaeological, and archaeological institutions, which invest great efforts in the investigation and better understanding of the past. It is fascinating to learn how new and innovative tools of research can be applied to the investigation of this heritage and to the study of the history of both nations. The cooperation between Anahuac University of Mexico and the Antiquities Authority of Israel, together with uh, Tel Aviv University, Ben Gurion University, and others, is marvelous in the marvelous uh, Magdala project, which I had the pleasure to visit just before starting my posting as ambassador of Israel in Mexico, is just one example of the great accomplishments that can be achieved when excellent scholars from both countries work together. In these difficult and complicated times for Israel, it's heartwarming to see fruitful and positive initiatives like this webinar taking place. I want to express my appreciation to the organizers and to wish all the participants an interesting and enriching experience. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Inad, for your words. So now, can you, um, Andrea, please, can you introduce our yes. first speaker, please? Once again, uh, well, Ambassador Inad, thank you so much as well for those amazing words. And well, we will start with our first um, speaker, who is Julia Schiller from the Barso University. Um, well, Julia, the floor is yours. If you can give a brief a presentation or a brief um, introduction of who you are and start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to you and to the whole committee for inviting me uh, and um, the, to giving me possibility to share my research and my uh, PhD. Uh, my name is Julia Hilla. I'm from Faculty of Archaeology, Department of Archaeology of Americas from University of Warsaw. I've been working in Warmay Valley since um, 2012. Um, I joined, joined the project um, 
and I had the opportunity to write the, my PhD uh, about my research in the Warme Valley, but in the context of the digital archaeology. I've been also specializing in digital archaeology, and I'm uh, teaching right now at the Faculty of uh, Archaeology uh, to the MA and BA students, both in English and in Polish. Um, so that's short introduction. Um, I would uh, now I will move to towards the topic itself. I would like to present you a part of my PhD, uh, which is connected with the Warme Valley and the use of the cultural heritage management uh, in, in this research. Mm -hmm. Of course, first of all, I uh, would need to mention that uh, the I am a member of a quite larger team. Uh, it's a Pol Polish-Peruvian archaeological project, uh, which is led by Professor Miłosz Giersz uh, from the Faculty of uh, Archaeology, University of Warsaw. Uh, however, we have several uh, specialists, both from the University of Warsaw, but also from uh, different fa uh, faculties, not only archaeology. And as well, we are uh, co-working with the Peruvian archaeologists and uh, specialists, including Professor Krzysztof Makowski, and and Roberto Pimentel-Nita, who is co-director of the excavations in Pastillo de Warme. Um, our research area is located north from Lima, around uh, 300, 400 kilometers north from Lima at the coast. Um, and the research in Warme Valley around the site called Castillo de Warme uh, is uh, led since 2010. Um, this is where a uh, first pre-Columbian empire uh, called Wari Empire uh, created a uh, quite important uh, center. Mm. The Warme Valley itself um, stretches for around 45 kilometers towards west, uh, where it ends uh, at Pacific Ocean. It begins in a, a town called Wamba, where two rivers, Malvas and Aija, connect into a river called um, Warme. The valley itself uh, is, uh, for the most of the part, rather a canyon-like uh, valley, which ends up with the quite flat delta uh, and river which flows into the ocean itself. Um, it is here where, in uh, on the site called Castillo de Warme, uh, in 2012, uh, Professor Gersh uh, and his team uh, discovered a uh, mausoleum and uh, a Wari mausoleum and also an untouched burial <coughs> below it. Um, just briefly to present you the chronology of the site itself, we are in a uh, so-called Middle Horizon, uh, which is uh, the same period as, more or less the same period as the Wari Empire uh, was existing, that's around 600 to 1000 AD. Uh, Wari Empire was a formation uh, which stretched uh, through almost the whole uh, Peru, modern day Peru, uh, with the um, uh, with the starting from the south and evolving towards the north. And Warme, <coughs> Castillo de Warme, uh, what our research was one of the points which uh, confirmed that the uh, Imperium itself reached this point and probably went further north. <clears throat> the mausoleum itself, uh, I uh, would like to just present you um, in, in briefly uh, what was there as uh, it was the main center of my research. However, my topic today will not be discussing the the um, connections inside the burial chamber or the mausoleum itself or its uh, um, <clears throat> uh, landscape, uh, archaeological landscape context. However, it was the, the most important part because it made us question what is in the valley itself and why the Castillo de Warme became was so important. Uh, so when Professor Gersh uh, discovered uh, the burial chamber itself, it contained uh, 64 women 
uh, which were buried there alongside more than 1,400 quite precious objects, uh, which included uh, golden orejeras, uh, which you can see here, uh, spindle rolls from stone pottery, but also from silver and gold as well, uh, quite fabulous uh, uh, metal objects, uh, I, uh, ivory objects, which were a sign of very great craftsmanship, uh, containers, wooden containers for the coca uh, and uh, for the uh, calcium as well. Um, many of the objects uh, are very unique in their style. And of course, a very um, big uh, quantity of quite amazing pottery, uh, which we are still analyzing and trying to see what's behind the symbology of it. But also um, it is uh, proof that the, there was a very high craftsmanship uh, in this, uh, around this uh, center. And of course we found one of the first one, uh, Kipus, which could be dated to the Wari uh, Empire times. Uh, the find itself was, um, published in many uh, uh, international media, including National Geographic, and research of Professor Gersh was uh, uh, awarded with the top 10 discoveries of archaeology magazine, first 2012, uh, thanks to the discovery of the burial chamber itself, and recently in 2022, uh, when he discovered the uh, also untouched uh, uh, burials of the craftsmen who were uh, uh, very, uh, very close by the, the mausoleum itself. Uh, my PhD uh, was connected with understanding the special location of the mausoleum, uh, but not only to better understand the valley itself. Uh, it was divided into three elements. Um, the first one connected with the War Warme Valley uh, and the adjacent Culebras Valley from the perspective of the cultural resource management from the digital archaeology part. Uh, the second middle part of me, my PhD focused mostly on the delta and the landscape archaeology context of the location of the mausoleum. And in my third part of my PhD, I was talking about the burial chamber itself with the 64 women and the more than 1,400 objects and what the, their location and relation to the artifacts was. However, today I will talk only about my first uh, part, connected with the Warme Valley itself. Um, the research questions that I had for that part uh, were how did the Castillo de Warme was communicated with other sites dated to the same period, located in the valley and also in adjacent valleys, and did, did, did this influence the role in the region of the site? And also, is the mausoleum uh, at Castillo de Warme located intentionally? And was what was the meaning of this location at micro and macro scale? In this context, more in uh, we are talking about macro scale. Uh, I will be discussing several methods, uh, but uh, probably most of you uh, know uh, know quite, them quite very well. Um, those are uh, analyses of satellite images, um, archaeological uh, reconnaissance uh, connected with the use of, for example, mobile GIS. And I briefly uh, would like to also talk about the least cost path analysis that I managed to do also for uh, based on the data that I have collected. Mm -hmm. Warme Valley was uh, surveyed in the past uh, several times. The latest uh, before I started my research was research of Professor uh, Duccio Bonavia, uh, who did his survey in 1976. And he described and discovered uh, in total 133 sites, uh, including the sites from Middle Horizon. So that's the period, uh, the same period of time as uh, Castillo de Verme. Um, for my research, I used several different data uh, and I tried to create a um, workflow uh, which currently uh, is quite intuitive and most of us use them before we are starting any type of archaeological reconnaissance or, or surveying, which of course include, uh, includes analysis of the archival uh, maps, archival data that we have, but uh, as well satellite images um, to mark the, the so-called areas of interest uh, to 
convert them to the mobile GIS uh, format. Um, next, of course, was uh, prospection or the um, reconnaissance of the points which were um, discovered or marked or were marked by, are from the maps created by Duccio Bonavia. Um, of course, all of this data later on had to be post-processed and integrated into uh, GIS base. Uh, and uh, this data was based for the further analysis, uh, comparisons, spatial distribution, least cost pass analysis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, our final goal in this whole process uh, always should be the not maybe the final, but the proposition of the interpretation of the results, both from the intra and inter side. So, what uh, these distributions of the different site might tell us about the site we are interesting in this particular case, we are talking, of course, about the mausoleum at Castillo de Verme. So, uh, I had several different data sets um, that I used before going into the field. Field. That would include uh, satellite images, including uh, images with infrared, which uh, allowed me to create uh, NDVE indexes. That's, that's indexes which tell, shows us if the vegetation is healthy or is uh, sick. And if we can see patterns of a healthy or sick vegetation, which would be quite regular, that might suggest that there are some archaeological remains uh, under it. I also uh, had a uh, possibility to use um, the archival uh, aerial, uh, aerial photographs done by the Peruvian military, uh, which were very good quality, and uh, they showed a lot of uh, landscape from 1970s, 80s, and the, all of the images were georeferenced, and then a photo interpret to look for the, uh, any possible archaeological sites that uh, are were visible, for example, in the past, but might not be visible also now. And I end up with uh, around, uh, if I recall, were uh, 700 uh, um, <clears throat> or so, let's say around uh, areas of interest uh, that I wanted to visit, uh, including the sites uh, marked by Duccio Bonavilla. H however, when I was doing photo in interpretations, uh, I tried not to use any of the data from the Bonavia as to confirm uh, my own methods are as accurate as well. Um, so next was my process of just physically walking and visiting all of those uh, points. And that took me in total three seasons, two months every, every season. And at the end, I documented uh, 501 archaeological sites, uh, which included uh, 368 new uh, sites that were not mentioned uh, in our, any archival source or they were not marked or described by uh, Duccio Bonavilla. From cultural, point, uh, cultural heritage point of view, I also managed to verify or see through the satellite images that 219 archaeological sites were threatened with uh, destruction. And this destruction was uh, had different categories. We had destruction uh, which was caused by natural causes like earthquakes, earthquakes or uh, landslides. Uh, however, most of them, of course, were unfortunately human threats as uh, this site, which you can see inside the yellow circle, this site was um, newly discovered, unknown archaeological site that uh, is very clearly visible on archival uh, photos. I had possibility to visit this site in 2012 and documented to do the photos. And it was very good that I did so because uh, already in 2018, um, their uh, uh, urbanization came into the spot and there are many, the site is completely covered by many new houses which appear here. Um, and which, yeah, the site is currently completely unavailable and probably mostly destroyed, unfortunately. Uh, the other example could be those uh, very interesting structures uh, for which I 
do not unfortunately have any interpretation. Um, and I would love to, of course, verify them. However, uh, already in 2009, um, all, of, all of the sites is, became covered by the agricultural fields, which uh, when I'm checking from time to time, current satellite images, unfortunately they are spreading and they are covering more and more interest um, for this part in the future of course i'm trying i'm planning to implement the um, automatic classification of the images uh, to see the spread of the of the agriculture and to monitor further the sites that uh, uh, are not destroyed yet but to check how if the uh, agriculture or, or uh, is the um, urbanization coming closer, closer to them. And also in 2017, we had a huge flood in the whole uh, Warme Valley due to the El Nino. And uh, um, also uh, this type of monitoring will help us to uh, check on the uh, all other sites that are, um, especially those one which are newly discovered to jump on them and to fully the, the document them and at the end i will i hope i will manage to show you an example uh, how we are uh, doing it um and to sum up this this uh, part short of this quite short part um this helped me to uh, discover and to document location of middle horizon sites which here i use later on for further analysis to see the connection of castillo de warma itself with the uh, adjacent uh, uh, culebras valley for that part of the research i received a grant from the german Tandem X, uh, which uh, they uh, uh, gave me the, um, the digital elevation model called Terra SRX, uh, made from twin satellites, and uh, this uh, uh, gave me the digital elevation model of the accuracy of 12 meters and uh, allowed me to uh, do further quite interesting uh, analysis, especially connected to the least cost path uh, analysis. Um, <clears throat> however, the data sets uh, um, which I received were, of course, not fully clean. And this is the print screen of the first lines of the data sets uh, which I received with the uh, height values of minus 1999, uh, which presented itself in the software, of course, like this, where we have many huge height differences uh, which needed to be edited and uh, when I checked the histogram of the data, uh, data set itself, you can see that there were many, many pixels which uh, did not have correct values and needed to be properly prepared before any type of uh, further analysis. And for that, I was using mostly the, um, uh, the option of uh, averaging uh, pixels uh, heights to the uh, to take the average from the, the their neighbors. Uh, why I did so? Um, here you have a part of the um, digital elevation model uh, from Warme Valley towards north to, towards Culebras Valley, and uh, you clearly can see there is one line which, when I made least of path analysis, the first one, my first try. Uh, the software said that, yes, this is the, the easiest and the fastest way towards north. And they were completely correct, as this is the highway, the main Panamericana highway going through the, um, through the Peru. Uh, but of course, it is not a pre-Columbian road, so I needed to uh, work around also this. And uh, I also tried to um, reconstruct the, the landscape uh, with averaging and also with checking the, the the hills and the slopes that were cut through uh, by the Panamericana. So this is the final, this is before and this is after and um, after only after editing such a such a, such a digital uh, elevation model, I could uh, move forward to create the, um, the model itself. Just brief view of how the histogram of the height pixels look like after the uh, editing of the data. Mm. For the model, I also use information about the land use, which I have from 1970s, uh, which is uh, not, of course, not the same as per Columbian one, but was quite 
close to the, the let's say, colonial one. And the narrow strips of the valley itself suggest that that uh, this data set, this data might be uh, quite well used with the uh, with this uh, REA. And of course, uh, I also had to in implement uh, structures that I saw through the satellite images. Here you can see a dune, which is bef between two valleys. And when I was creating the uh, models, I created four different models uh, for the least cost paths. Uh, uh, in some of them, I did include the, um, this dune. In some of them, I did not, as uh, when I was checking through the satellite images, uh, the remains of the roads which were visible through the satellite images, I saw that some of them go under the dune. They disappear in the dune. So it might suggest that the dune itself moved or appeared later than the uh, times that I was interested. So for the creation of the least cost path model, I used the standard information, including the landscape uh, data sets, uh, the oh, land use, sorry, land use uh, data sets, as well the, the information about the dune. And uh, I created models which uh, were supposed to uh, prefer to the roads inside the valleys itself, but also through the desert, to cut through the desert. Um, and out of those uh, four different scenarios, um, I present you now all of them together. Uh, they are connecting Castillo de Guarme with several sites from the middle horizon, from the same, same period of time, uh, which are located in the Culebras Valley. And um, this uh, I supplemented uh, with the uh, photo interpretation uh, of the uh, roads that I uh, noticed. I also had possibility to, uh, for what, uh, one season, briefly check parts of those roads uh, closer to Castillo de Arme and confirm that model and the satellite images do suggest correctly that there are uh, such pre-Columbian uh, roads. And as a result, as the final interpretation inside this whole process that I proposed, at the, the workflow I proposed at the beginning of my work, I could present the interpretation um, of the pre-Columbian network system between Castillo de Guarme and how Castillo de Guarme was implemented inside this uh, the system it, itself. And to uh, finish up my presentation, uh, as I'm skipping with the time, just briefly, I would like to mention what we do with the sites, archaeological sites that are under the threat. This is a site called PV PV355, which um, is threatened by agriculture. And uh, also, I checked it before our presentation. Unfortunately, those fields are currently right now going on the site itself. Um, we are using um, uh, uh, mo so called mobile GIS, uh, which can be an application which can be uh, installed on the smartphones. Uh, the smartphone ch uh, application. Uh, takes the geolocalization from the uh, point and allows students uh, uh, to uh, describe the artifacts uh, that they see. Uh, such an application uh, can be written in XLS format with very specific question, uh, questions which are connected with the type of artifacts which are um, in pre could be found in pre-Columbian uh, landscape. And uh, this also allows uh, to control more or less the answers of the students, that uh, especially those who are just in training and they do not know the material too well. But uh, because the applications uh, give several types of answers, so they have choose they ha they have to choose from uh, this uh, like if you find pottery, is it painted or not, and what does the painting represent? What are the colors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, here you can see uh, here you can see example how does it look like on the phone itself where at the beginning the students uh, choose the uh, type of artifact that they are uh, describing and documenting its location and uh, further on a new type of question depending on the artifact itself uh, appear which uh, allows us to the describe this artifact in more and more detail and later on in interpretation it helps us to understand uh, what it could be. Also, of course, you have possibility to add the photos uh, of those artifacts right away. Uh, students after coming home 
um, can upload all of this data to the cloud straight away. This makes the data sets available uh, through the GIS online, and I can uh, download this data straight away. Uh, as well, I can check the basic statistics uh, uh, of the collected material. Um, for this particular site, we documented uh, 1,132 uh, artifacts, uh, and we did it in three days. There were, was six students uh, who were documenting for three days. So I think it really does speed up um, the possibility to document uh, things uh, are visible on the surface. And here you can see also the, <clears throat> the um, photos which are included. Um, they are uh, quite good quality photos. However, further on, when I continue my research later on in Tunisia, I uh, develop the method further on that we do collect the diagnostic parts of the pottery and we redo the, the photos of them. Uh, I'm almost done, yes. Um, you can also export the reports. And this is how you implement the data into GIS and you can check all of the answers and uh, all of the <clears throat> photos which are included into the app. And this, again, helps us further on to create the final interpretation. So for this particular site, Ducho Bonavia wrote that it's a cemetery from the uh, earlier period. Uh, however, I managed, thanks to this three, three days work only, I managed to propose that this is a multi-chronological site with multi-function, not only cemetery, but also a settlement and maybe a religious center. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the questions. Wow, Julia, thank you so much. It, it was very interesting. Um, so we will continue with the next uh, speaker. The questions, we will have them for the to the end. So, but yes, thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Carlos Varela from the Centro Ina Chiapas. And Carlos, the floor is yours, so you can introduce yourself uh, briefly and start uh, sharing with us this amazing topic about digital documentation used in southeastern Mexico. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, okay. yes, thank you, yes, Carlos. You we are uh, delighted to participate in uh, this webinar, which aims to connect international researchers working on applying science and archaeology. Well, my main field is uh, so archaeology, but I am uh, interested in working on, on landscape archaeology. So that's the reason we and uh, Luis and, 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 and me are working together. He's the expert on the matter, but I'm going to speak uh, in the end for both. Um, today, uh, our focus will be on the integration of technology into archaeological practices. Specifically, we will de delve into cases studies from southeastern Mexico, highlighting the application of photogrammetry techniques and geographic information systems. Nowadays, to say that GIS are new technologies is somewhat questionable, as they have been integrated into various scientific domains for many, many years. Therefore, we will assume that most of you have read or heard about GIS, and we will not give another definition. On the contrary, we will only summarize the GIS, that GIS encompass more than just programs. It constitutes a collection of tools facilitating the acquisition and narration of valuable information for the decision-making process. In real science, these tools are linked to a specific question and or, and or objectives. In archaeology, GIS holds pivotal significance for tasks so, such as data management and storage. Visualizing and identifying structures within, within dense jungles, recording and analyzing architectural elements, and detecting features associated with agriculture and social systems. 
in southeastern Mexico, particularly at three archaeological sites, Palenque, Moral Reforma, and El Tigre, these technologies have deployed to map extensive areas containing remnants of Mayan culture, document excavations, and digitalize clusters and entire buildings. In the case of Palenque, a renowned classic Maya city located in the first in the first foothills of the Chiapas Highlands, mapping efforts were initiating using unnamed uh, unmanned sorry, aerial vehicles. The primary aim was to capture orthophotes of the site's protection polygon. These images coupled with digital elevation model obtained from uh, LiDAR technology. And this has made it possible to identify the level of current, current anthropo anthro anthropic impact in relation to the location of archaeological elements. This work required the use of various elements such as photogrammetric techniques, placement, the installation, and georeferencing control points using high precision GNSS and then terrain specific digital elevation models derived from LiDAR point clouds. These elements were integrated with the EIS framework to achieve the stated objective. These same, same data were also used to find traces of the use of aquatic resources in the vicinity of the large city, such as possible diversions in the form of trust in the river. Similarly, entire buildings and architectural complexes were digitally recorded to establish a comprehensive digital archive for evaluating their conservation status. For instance, these digital records were as to as the, the condition of roofs, examine architectural features like wall, like wall white, white and conduct topographic analysis through computer generated sections. And these are uh, examples. For, for, uh, for example, this is the Pakal's tomb who, uh, that's inside this uh, huge temple, the Temple of Inscriptions. We also uh, did photogrammetic studies for entire pieces. This is another uh, example uh, with uh, an entire building, the Temple of the Foliar of the Cross, and an another temple, the Temple of the Count, in, in the low part. As for El Tigre, a site of significant importance in preclassic Maya history, situated in the context of large river and serve as a connection between different regions. Map efforts were conducted to document the monthly advancements in the process of excavating the main structures. And this is the like the time lapse, time lapse of the process. Another example of how uh, the buildings at the end. This is the uh, almost the whole site. Mascarons uh, or mascaron sculptures of some buildings were also digitalized in order to obtain, in the medium term, exact replicas of this be exhibited in the place of the original and thus, and thus avoid their deterioration. Coordinates were also taken of such elements such as tele and altar in order to evaluate in orthophotos and digital elevation models the alignments of a possible uh, type E group formed by tile structures of by the tile talus structures of the site. In the case of Moral Reforma, extensive mapping was conducted to assess the presence of archaeological structures within the protected area. Additionally, significant archaeological artifacts and human remains unearthed during excavations were digitalize. These three 
dimensional models not only enable report presentations, but also facilitate measurement and cross sections for a deeper compression of the elements involved. The quality of the products and their accuracy is linked to the methodology applied. However, as I mentioned from the beginning, GIS are a set of tools that allow this type of work, but with the specific coordinates. That is to say, all the digitalizations, maps, three-dimensional models, digital elevation models, etc., have the basic element of a GIS, coordinates. Let's recall the fundamental disparity between a GIS and a database manager. While both systems manage data, a GIS requires that all data possess a spatial component. So, as you can well imagine, all the images that we have presented so far have the ability to be dumped into a system with a specific locations. And right, here is another of the elemental, element, fundamental objectives for which this work has carried out. It's in, uh, uh, the dissemination or divulgation of the, of the cultural heritage. This is another example of archaeological pieces, uh, a burial with the uh, pots, and another example of how we documented the process of excavations, different elements, uh, particular pieces, for example. And now, uh, the next point. In our contemporary digital landscape where much of our interactions or occurs through screens, the dissemination of archaeological heritage has been profoundly impacted. Today, individuals can virtually explore renowned institutions like the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, from anywhere in the world. This accessibility is made possible through virtual, virtual tours granting visitors and internet users the opportunity to navigate iconic spaces and view celebrated artists. Across the globe, numerous projects are dedicated to digitalizing the world's cultural heritage, employing techniques like those discussed earlier. Some of these initiatives aim to support research, generate information for dissemination purposes, or simply serve as a comprehensive record of cultural asserts. It is important to recognize that none of these objectives are mutually exclusive. The data generated can often fulfill multiple purposes, including dissemination. In the case of uh, Southeastern Mexico, the information derived from various GIS products fulfills the objective of creating a detailed record of building excavations and the site as a whole. However, we are aware of the potential for utilizing these products for dissemination purposes as well. This possesses another uh, significant challenge. While GIS technology requires specialized knowledge, not everyone possesses the expertise to operate it effectively. Nonetheless, there are various techniques available that uh, enable the conversion of GIS products into a computer language accessible to individuals of all levels of proficiency, regardless of their familiarity with, familiarity with this tool. So as we have seen so far, GIS technology is very useful in archeological work. Its current, its correct application according to specific object objectives allow us to obtain new data and information from them. However, our aspirations extend beyond mere data storage. Management, analysis, and creation. The ultimate goal is to generate visualization that can be accessed and appreciated by people worldwide, regardless of their geographical localization. That would be all. Thanks. Thank you, Carlos, oh. for your presentation. That was amazing. So now, Nitsan, can you present our next uh, present presenter, please? Yes. 
thank you again, Carlos. Uh, I'm happy to invite our next speaker, Dr. Michal Birkenfeld from uh, the Department of Archaeology in Ben Gurion University uh, to give us her talk on uh, GIS applications in Israeli archaeology, tracing, documenting, and analyzing cultural heritage. Michal. Hi, thank you so much. Let me just start with putting up the presentation. Um, I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, but the presentation or the... Yeah, yeah, we can see the oh. presentation. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you, Gerardo, and thank you, Nitsan and uh, Rosaro and Andrea for the invitation and for organizing this wonderful webinar. Um, I'm afraid that my talk is uh, quite more general than the two previous talks, um, taking into account that perhaps we have a few... Um, newcomers to, to these types of technology. Uh, I would like to try and give a more general view of GIS and its various uses in archaeology, especially in Israeli archaeology. Um, so I will start with a very, very quick introduction to what GIS is. I hope that it's not too redundant to this uh, crowd. Uh, and what are its benefits for archaeology? And then move for a few examples from research we've been having, uh, we've been holding in, in the past few years. So. No, it's not moving. Can you see the next? Uh... Oh, OK. So ever since the earliest days of archaeology, the special element of the data we collect was of great importance. Now, this is due not only to the fact, or basically due to the fact that almost all of the information we collect is spatial in nature. Each artifact, its structure, its site has not only a physical location, an X, Y, Z, or a provenance of its own, but also a wide area of spatial information, spatial relationship between itself and other archaeological features, between itself and the surrounding, the environment, even celestial objects, if you'd like. However, until not that far away, uh, not, not that far ago, most, if not all of our spatial information was collected and arranged and analyzed by hand and by visual appraisal. Now, it was only in the 1960s with the advent of processual archaeology that mathematical and statistical models entered the field of archaeology in an attempt to quantify our data and to take the subjective appraisal out of the process. Now, this, of course, reached the climax with the entrance of computers and the computerized revolution into the world of science. Cartographic or CAD software, database management software, all transformed completely the way we do archaeology. Now, if you think about the mere fact that until then, every map was drawn by hand um, and every change required a new map to be created. Now, there's no question that computers changed dramatically the methods we apply in archaeological research. The introduction of GIS or geographic information systems has brought spatial archaeology into the next level. But what is GIS? Now, I'm not going to get very deeply into it, but because as I see most of our um, uh, of, of, of uh, the participants are well versed in this, but in the most basic terms, for those who are not, GIS are comprised of a map connected to a table. So each feature on the table has a list of attributes that describe it, but it also has a geographic location on the map. So this allows us to ask numerous queries from either aspect of the data, okay? Now, this two-way structure of the GIS is what helped very much its quick adoption in archaeology, because it's very similar to how information used to be kept in archaeological archives previously. But most importantly, and you've seen this in the in the past two lectures, GIS can serve as a very as an active interface, okay, that can accommodate all of the different data sources we now have, whether it's satellite uh, derived multispectral imagery or fifty year old handwritten archives from old excavations. And it allows its individual analysis. But so I can use it to explore almost an unlimited number of data sets. But more, most importantly, I can explore different data sets together in a very integrative manner based on geographic anchoring or the georeferencing of the data. So, what do we do with GIS? Uh, the first thing, one of the first things that archaeology utilized GIS for, and we just saw a beautiful example of it. 
is the National Archives and cultural or, and, or heritage management. Now we heard uh, a wonderful example now, um, the quick adoption of GIS for heritage archives was mainly due to the similarity between the structures of GIS and our traditional archives, as I said. In the Israeli Antiquities Authority, uh, which I had the pleasure of working at for the well for, for quite a few years uh, during my studies, um, basic GIS-based projects started already as early as 1995. Nowadays, all of the different archives are GIS-based. I will not expand on this since I'm sure that Chai, uh, Chai Ashkenazi, who is here with us, will present in depth after me. The other main usage of GIS has to do with field recording. So the vast majority of the data we collect nowadays on field is digital in nature, whether it's plans, graphic recordings, artifact provenances. But until not long ago, everything was still drawn by hand and then digitized in a very long and very tiresome process. Now, photogrammatic 3D models are uploaded and can be used as auxiliary aid for the architect who draws the plans in digital vector on using a tablet. And with the total station or RTK, we can enter each artifact in 3D provenance. So these are all automatically uploaded to the cloud, enabling immediate access to the different scholars and experts who study the material. And it is hard for those of us that were born into this to understand what a game changer this was in archaeological recording. But what I like to focus on and what I personally enjoy best, uh, and that is the analytical capabilities of GIS. Uh, which are many times um, put aside. Now, as I said earlier, and as we saw very, very beautifully in, in Julia's um, example, GIS serves as a single interface with which we can integrate all of the different data sources, whether it's site location points, architectural plans, 3D topography model, uh, DEMs, or even satellite-based imagery. Okay, and it is all connected and geographically referenced and can be integrated into one in-depth analysis. First and foremost, it enables us to build complex models of the real world. Okay, like uh, Julia just uh, talked about the least cost path uh, analysis, for example. So if we look at the example here, let's say we have a settlement uh, and two task specific sites, okay, one closer to the other. Traditionally, based on the law of least efforts, etc., we would expect the inhabitants of the site to prefer uh, the closer the site closer to them. But what if the topography in the area looked like this? Okay, so the site further away might be much easier to reach, much more accessible uh, than the one supposedly close by. And indeed, straight line distances can be very, very misleading. So using GIS, we can create a topography-based model that will help us calculate the nearest path from one point to another. Here, for example, you can see the easiest route or the least cost path based on topography, but topography isn't everything. Um, we can in fact build models that are much, much more complex than that. We can take into account cost factors like vegetation or group composition uh, or carrying weights, sorry, or group composition. Uh, and we can also decide to weigh in facilitating factors, okay, like roads or seafaring. Um, so we can in fact build extremely complex models to try and get as close as we can to real life. Uh, we can use these to understand not only how people traveled from one place to another, but how human, humans organize their surroundings, how they perceive their landscapes, how hunter-gatherers walk through the terrain, or how the Roman Empire moved materials from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. Um, the same type of modeling allows us to calculate daily exploitation territories, how far, for example, one can travel for half an hour or one hour or two hour walk distances from a settlement site. Once I delineate this area, I can start with the integrative analysis of the territory itself. What type of resources were there for exploitation? Why did the inhabits, inhabitants choose this location over others? Nowadays, we can use remote sensing to reconstruct palo environment, palo landscapes of this territory, calculate the area's carrying capacity based on vegetation indices, etc. GIS also allows us to quantify what we once couldn't quantify. Concepts of visibility, they've always been an important part of how we interpret sites. Sometimes our whole interpretation of the function of a site can be influenced by questions of visibility. 
especially when dealing with specific site types like forts, for example. We use phrases like hidden or prominent quite often when we describe a site. Now, visibility analysis is not new, not a new thing at all. I mean, Fraser, Rainfrew, others, they've done this type of research 100 years ago. The main issue was that the quantitative revolution of the processual archaeology have almost entirely skipped this type of analysis. I mean, how can one quantify abstract notions such as visual perception? One's eyesight is affected not only by subjective state, but also by the hour of the day and the season. I mean, no two people will see the same thing from the same points. And this began changing with the advent of GIS um, application. For example, uh, this is an example of a study of the Neolithic settlement system of the Galilee in northern Israel. One of the things we tested was visibility. And we found out that a very interesting thing, even though we had showed quite clearly that all of the sites were contemporaneous and were in contact with one another, none of the sites had visual connection with the others. However, all of them had direct line of sight to a specific point in the landscape, the top of Mount Baharan, Har Baharan in Hebrew. And when we went back to verify the results, we saw that yes, indeed, the mountain is indeed visible uh, from each and every one of the contemporary Neolithic sites in the region. The question is why? And the answer, which again, I'm sorry, I have to give it in short due to the time constraints, uh, is related to this one site uh, that you can see here below the mountain, the site of Farachoresh. The site of Farachoresh um, is one of the main Neolithic sites in the Galilee. It spans the entire period, about 1500 years in total. We're talking about ninth to eighth uh, millennia uh, BCE. And the site's most prominent feature are burials. Burials occur under, within, above, around plaster surface structures, cysts, um, in open areas or in relation to different installations. More than 65 burials have been uncovered so far. And these include a very wide range from single to multiple, from primary to secondary, different positions, etc. cetera. Um, now the small finds uh, assemblages are also very wide ranged and unique, it includes exotic materials such as minerals brought to the site from Sinai Peninsula and Anatolia, uh, Transjordan and the Dead Sea. We've got shells that were modified into pendants and beads and cult objects, um, such as the well-known plastered skulls. Uh, stone and clay figurines, and a very wide range, range of grave goods. So the unique character of the site with its large number of burials and exceptional material culture have brought the excavators to identify it as a mortuary site, a ritual locale for the neighboring villages. And basically what the visibility analysis gave us was a glimpse to a completely different aspect of this site. Because on the one hand, it is extremely, extremely hidden um, the location of the site itself is extremely hidden. You will not be able to see it unless you're very, very close to it. But now it's immediately below a major landscape feature that we know is visible from each and every site from that period in the region. So it gave us a completely different aspect um, that we weren't aware of before. And lastly, just because everything I discussed so far were large scale landscape questions, I do want to stress the point that GIS can also aid our intrasite analysis, whether when questioning artifact distributions or apply advanced spatial statistics uh, to discover special activity areas, uh, post depositional processes, etc. And indeed, one of the main problems that we had at Kfar Choresh was that much of the small finds, uh, in this example here is the lithic assemblage, including hundreds and thousands of artifacts, came from the open areas between the structures and between the different features. And it was impossible to identify which phase it belonged to. So basically through statistical interpolation of known anchors, we calculated a series of base surfaces, each representing a terminus postquem and antiquem of each stratum, as you can see here. And this allowed us to see where one stratum cuts another, as you can see here, and to identify disturbances in the stratigraphic sequence, and then cut those disturbances out, recreating the actual limits of each clean context of each different stratum. 
And then we could assign each and every artifact to its secure stratigraphic unit, which again allowed in turn a much more detailed diachronic analysis of each of the different uh, phases at the site. So to conclude, and again, I apologize if this was a bit too general, but GIDS can deal with huge amounts of data efficiently. And it allows for very complex cal calculations and models involving many, many data sets, both archeological and environmental. It allows us to take many factors into account, but also filter the factors that we don't want. And as, as you already know, there are hundreds of tools. The fact that GIS is used by, I think almost every uh, um, avenue of research nowadays, uh, has brought about thousands and thousands of tools. We just need to be able to ask the right questions. And of course, no data set is too much or too little, too big or too little. And the questions we ask is what changes with the resolution. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Michal, for this very interesting lecture. Uh, I'm now happy to invite our final speaker for this uh, afternoon, uh, Dr. Chaya Ashkenazi, head of the Geoinformatics Department uh, in the Israel Antiquities Authority, for his talk, uh, Preserving Cultural Heritage Using Digital Technology. Whose role is it? Hi. Hi, everybody. Let me just share. Okay, so, so thank you for inviting me and also thank you for a uh, very interesting uh, lecture. <clears throat> and my lecture is supposed to be kind of an uh, answer to them. And I'm not sure I can answer, uh, but I will speak something more, less about uh, archaeological sites uh, or examples of archaeological sites, but I will speak more about how do we preserve the, the heritage and, and who's responsible for it? So, um, first, what, what, is, what does it mean, cultural heritage? What do I see in cultural heritage connected to archaeology? So, what I see there is, is ancient sites, either the, the ones that were excavated already or those that were not excavated, uh, ancient cities and buildings, uh, ancient artifacts as well as ecofacts and ancient texts. The threats that we have for all these is first is natural disaster. Uh, one of the pictures I took uh, uh, is like a flood of, of the first of, of the first lecture. Also, we have like the normal erosion and degradation of the story. We have uh, uh, human-made disasters, which which. Uh, 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 now we can see it in this area, like in, in, in form of wars, maybe mainly, but also uh, 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 human-made uh, development, that uh, new construction and, and that, that goes over uh, uh, ancient sites. And also, uh, uh, we must say that archaeology itself is destruction, so we also endanger the the, the, the ancient sites. Uh, so how, how do we digitally preserve the past? And we saw it in some in the lectures that we had. We have, first we have photography, and today we also have uh, GIS. We have 3D scanning. Uh, of, of Usually when I speak about 3D scanning, I mean uh, artifact scanning and, and photogrammetry. Uh, which means, like in, in the Antiquities Authority, what we do at every excavation, uh, we do a photogrammetic model of the whole excavation one, once every at least a week. Uh, and this is part of the, of the preserving of the heritage because eventually most of our excavations, afterwards, there will be uh, development, there will be construction over these uh, excavations. And the last thing is, is LIDAR scan. Um, when we deal with the, with the preservation data, we also need to preserve that. And why? Uh, because first, software is getting obsolete. Like for example, if, if we have a, a, a file which, which were created in uh, Microsoft version one, Windows version one, I don't think we'll be able to read it now. Also, the hardware is not accessible. 
think about uh, the ancient, the, not ancient, but old floppy disk, and if we have data on them now, it will be pretty hard to to get it out now. Um, and also, if the if our backup was not good enough, uh, we can we can uh, 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 lose a lot of data. And usually in digital data, when you lose data, it's a lot of data. Also, even digital data can get corrupted. So even if we put it on, on that uh, hardware, and it, it still get can get corrupted. So it means that one of the things is that digital data needs to be constantly upgraded. It's kind of funny, but somehow, Things that were written on paper sometimes are more uh, uh, immune to to the time than digital data, and so we need to preserve it. We need to preserve it all the time, and we need to work on it all the time. And who should do that? <clears throat> so, so there are few, I don't know, people, organizations that can do it. First, the researchers, and as we can, we could see in the, especially in the first two lectures that we saw that researchers are dealing also with preserving their heritage, also the universities themselves, the public, and the government. And in general, as a representative, representative of, of the Israel Antiquities Authority, or kind of representative of the government, uh, so in general, governments have more resources than all of the above. And especially in Israel, the Antiquities Authority uh, controls all the data and all the antiquity sites. So we have more access and more possibility of preserving the sites and the data itself. So in general, I think the public authority, uh, which is the antiquity authority in the case of Israel, this is the organization who should preserve heritage sites and also the digital data accumulated to them. And also, the, all these data should be available to researchers and to the general public, of course. And this is something we we uh, we do we try to do in the last uh, uh, few years, and we're working on it. So, thank you very much. Hi, uh, great hi. Thank you for. Your lecture it was amazing for um, to those that don't have a uh, any understanding of how it's preserving in Israel I think it's a very good insight for that and thank you all also for your captivating presentations and for sharing your expertise in such an engaging manner it was really really good for all of us and now it's time for the discussion session and questions and answers so anyone from the audience that have any questions uh you can write it in the chat so far we have three in the queue. So the first question is for, I, I saw that you already answered it in the text, but uh, I think it will be more engaging if you uh, tell us everyone, uh, this question to, is to Julia. There are two questions to Julia. The first one is, did you check in your research sidelines from your site to the other sites discovered and uh, to check its visibility and prominence uh, in the landscape? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. One more time for question is very very good question. I did uh, uh, view shed total view shed analysis and the cumulative view uh, cumulative visibility analysis for the delta and for the middle horizon cemeteries in delta. So I really focus on very um, smart smaller part of the region. It was connected mostly with the second part of my PhD, with the lens, archaeological landscape and interpretation of the um, of the Castillo de Guadme inside this landscape and what its place and role inside that landscape. Uh, and I'm publishing results uh, about this very soon. Uh, here it turned out that the, um, uh, it, there was the, the location of Castillo de Guerme was uh, intentional. Um, it uh, it is connected with the seeing the whole delta uh, of the Guerme Valley, and uh, with two other uh, two 
three other, sorry, three other uh, archaeological sites that are located through the surveying, through the prospection. Uh, I managed to prove that all these three sites with Castillo de Herme are interconnected and they have visual total visual dominance over the region. It's connected more with the creation of so-called chulpas, so the burial towers, mausoleums, uh, known in pre-Columbian period. And it is known that in the pre-Columbian period, they were markings of the sacred landscape and markings of the boundary landscape as well. Mm, the visibility analysis I also done for the mm, uh, uh, net control points, uh, sorry, you're missing word, um, the watch watch points, which I, uh, in my survey, uh, in prospection, I found many uh, watch points. They turn out to be mostly above uh, the Quebrada or Wadi, depending on your region. Uh, and through that Wadi, through that Quebrada, the uh, least cost path model was proposing uh, that the road would be going through in several scenarios. Uh, so I check how, uh, when Castillo de Huerme would be visible from the road itself and from the, uh, the, how much is visible from those um, watch points uh, to confirm that uh, uh, Castillo de Huerme was connected with the road network. Um, it was rather connected not as a point, but as a point when you entry from the desert to the Freta Green Valley. Um, and the watch points also turn out to be in, in the total viewshed analysis, they turn out to be um, the most visible exposed place in the topography of the delta. And just after the watch points, it was Castillo de Huerme. So the most the watch points have the most of the view of the uh, of the valley of the delta, and then it's Castillo de Huerme who which has the most view from to the uh, around the delta. Perfect. I think this answers in very detail the, the question that uh, they have. Uh, there is another question also for you from Nitsan. And the question is, is there no legal protection in Peru or on registered archaeological site? What is the status of the recognized sites? Uh, of course, there is a legal protection. It's very, very well. We are even dealing right now with with uh, some of these processes. Um, uh, the sites are protected uh, quite well. However, as I wrote, yeah, the, um, the process of urbanization and agriculture is moving really, really fast. It's way faster than administration. So that's, a, of course, a problem. Uh, and the, the new sites, uh, well, they are under the process of being registered. Uh, that also, unfortunately, takes time. But the, um, the authorities in Peru works uh, very well and they are on a very high level and uh, everything is uh, with GIS connected and the measurements, uh, it's very well and very well described also in the law itself. So it, it, it is. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have another, another question from Hi to Michal Birkenfeld. And the question is, how did you date each horizon phase in the site? Is it according to the FLIM tools? Um, hi, yeah, I assume you talk about Kfar Horesh. Hi, then in Kfar Horesh, it was a combination. We had uh, a few C14 takes, so we were able to radiometrically date the site. Plus, in some of the occasions, we had to use uh, chronostratigraphy, I mean, chronotypology of the flint tools as well. Yeah, so it's a combination. Okay, thank you so much. Is there anyone from the audience that uh, would like to ask any question? I have a question uh, for uh, Sir, uh, yeah, yeah. sir yeah. I, I wrote another question in the chat. Just so that you don't miss it. Um. Oh yes. If all the, the there is another question to hi. Yes, right. Um. If all the cultural heritage is in the hands of the government, who is supervising that the considerations that the considerations what to preserve and how are always professional and not politically political? This to hi. Ah, yes, can I see? Ah, uh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it is that, like in the case, I can say about the case of Israel, the case of Israel, it's true that, that like we are uh, the representative of the state, but we do have a council of archaeology. So which, which includes archaeologists from universities mainly. 
and they have a say how how we do things, how we uh, decide what to activate, how we decide what to uh, what to preserve and what what not. So we have some kind of it, but uh, uh, so we don't have like uh, infinite infinite power. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, is there any other questions from the audience? So I have a question for Carlos. Um, which which current pro, I mean, which uh, projections do you see in the future for for what you're doing uh, in Mexico? What what do you think will be the next step? Well, uh, actually, I, I was talking with Luis uh, earlier this morning. So uh, one of our uh, plans are to write an article. But uh, right now, at uh, here in Palenque, for example, uh, we are working on a, on the Maya train project, and um, there are new uh, uh, spaces that are going to be open to the public. So we are trying to uh, incorporate all of this uh, visual uh, material into the museum of Palenque, for, 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 for example. So uh, people can interact with the, with the digging, with the excavation, but see it through uh, maybe a, a, a 3D um, lens. And we also uh, want to incorporate all this uh, visual data into big screens so people can uh, interact uh, with it. And this project is uh, actually happening uh, now. It's going on now. And that's what we are, are trying to, to do in the next few months. Okay, thank you. Uh, any Thanks. other questions from someone? Okay, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank to Einat for the opening words. And of course, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Michal. And thank you, Hai, for it was a really amazing presentation. I, I think everybody here will get a little piece of what we do in Mexico or what else we'll say we do it because now in Israel, what, what do they do in Israel, what they do in Mexico. And I hope you all liked it. I also would like to, take to, to thank to the audience. And remember that uh, if you want to receive the future webinars and to have it in advance and also to, to see this recorded webinar, you can join to our mailing list, which is now in the chat, or you can also access to our YouTube channel. And if there is nothing else more to, to say from you or any other question, I will close. I would like to close this webinar and thank you one. Thank you once again to everyone. And enjoy the rest of the day, and goodbye.